from the 2012 Almanac of American Politics, quote, Americans voted in record numbers for Democrats in 2008 and in record numbers for Republicans in 2010, close quote. That makes it one to one. Here today to tell us how Americans will break that tie, Michael Barone. Uncommon knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, shooting today in Washington, D.C. I'm Peter Robinson. A fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, the senior political analyst at the Washington Examiner, and for some four decades, the principal author of the biennial Almanac of American Politics, Michael Barone is by common consent the dean of American political journalists. I checked with a couple of friends and it is common consent. Michael, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm not sure what uh, qualifications you need to be as a dean, but I suspect one of them is being old. <laughs> so I'm not sure I really want the no, title. No, no, no. Segment one, two quotations. Roger Stone, longtime political operative, former Republican, recently declared that he's a libertarian. Quote, if the GOP primary turns into a race divided by regional preferences, Santorum carrying the Midwest, Gingrich parts of the South and Romney performing well in the Northeast and the West, a brokered convention becomes extremely likely. Quotation two, Karl Rove, former Bush advisor in the Wall Street Journal. Let's put it this way. The odds are greater that there's life on Pluto than that the GOP has a brokered convention, close quote. What's Michael Barone saying? Well, when we talk about brokered conventions, I think what we have in mind is the kind of conventions that existed prior to 1960, the multi-ballot conventions. I think the last one was the Democrats in 1952, three ballots. You had 103 ballots at the Madison Square Garden New York Convention in 1924. Uh, a resolution condemning the Ku Klux Klan failed of adoption, as I recall, by something like four votes out of 2,000. Year um, again? 1924. Um, and the Democratic nominee ended up getting 28% of the vote. Right. Uh, the, uh, 24 was Al Smith? Or? Uh, John W. Davis. John W. Davis. And the, you know, why don't we have those kind of conventions again? And the answer is if you go back and look at those conventions and you look at politics of that time, the convention was a unique communications medium. It was the only place where the politicians from the different states, mm -hmm. and in many states they had you know, hand-picked the delegations or the delegations were made up of people that were uh, supporters of the different party machines within the state or things of that nature. Um, and people didn't, you know, men of business, there weren't many women of business, men of business did not communicate by long distance telephone. We don't right. get direct distance telephone dialing till the mid-1950s. So it was like the stock market in the old days, you had to walk the floor to get information. That's right, you had to be in the convention city. James A. Farley would talk about how he got off the train at Union Station in Chicago in 1932 and started talking to people. Previously, men of business would you'd spend their day at their desk reading their correspondence, dictating replies to a secretary or a stenographer, uh, reading, proofreading the letters at the end of the day and signing them perhaps with a little P.S. Farley signed in green ink uh, all the time. That was the high tech of the day, the typewriter, the right. Underwood. Right. Uh, and you didn't pick up the phone. When Lyndon Johnson becomes president in 1964, there were uh, 63, uh, and after the shock of the Kennedy assassination, there are stories in the papers about Lyndon Johnson has got this phone next to his desk that's got multiple lines and he switches around and keeps several conversations going. The idea that the president would talk to the people on the phone as a way of doing business was novel. Okay, but so, so the convention was unique, a unique communications medium. Um, it isn't anymore. 70, you're going back, you're going back to the first half of the 20th century, Kansas City, 1976. What about that kind of a convention where Ronald Reagan and Jerry Ford show up, Ford has a small lead in the delegates, but going into the convention, nobody knew who would come out nominated as for president. Well, actually, what about something like actually, that? Actually, the media that? knew pretty much exactly what was going on because they had a delegate count. The first media delegate count was conducted by CBS by Marty Plissner in 1968 cycle. Before that, there was never a delegate count. I mean, you can go to the internet today and get multiple delegate counts and caveats about this delegates will be chosen at the state convention by this and so forth and so on. Uh, nobody 
had that information. It was something that you only became clear when you were at the convention. So in 1960, John Kennedy is nominated with the votes of the Wyoming delegation, the last state on the alphabetical roll call, and just before the territories would have voted. Uh, the press didn't know whether he was going to make it over the top with the majority at that point. By 76, that's the third cycle in which you have media delegate counts, and the media delegate counts proved absolutely correct. But what about Ford had an advantage over Reagan? Uh, you had the question of the Mississippi delegation and the unit rule. That's it. I was going they to say, what I thought people had Clark Reed's phone number and they were talking to him, the Mississippi Republican chairman, and they figured out what was going on. So there was deal. But isn't it the case that if Clark Reed had changed his mind and thrown Mississippi to Reagan, Reagan would have won that nomination? It, yeah. it was open in that sense. Yeah, but it was done before the convention it was assembled on the floor. The deal was done. I see. The deal was done. They were in Kansas City. The deal was done. They were in an era when people had, you know, it wasn't a cell phone era, but we did have long distance telephone conversations and things. So your view that any kind of uncertainty will be squeezed out of this primary system before we get to the convention? I think we there will, will be, know. you know, I suppose you can imagine scenarios where, you know, the uncertainty continues to the convention because people won't make a deal until absolutely the last moment they, they can make a deal. Uh, but I think that's highly unlikely. Certainly the communication, you know, what was the communication of the 76 convention? I can remember being at the um, lobby of one of the Kansas City hotels and seeing Paul Laxalt, Senator, Governor of Nevada, or former Governor of Nevada at that point, who was, a, you know, who was uh, no, he'd been elected to the Senate, right, he was a supporter, of, close and to supporter Reagan. one close to Reagan, and, uh, you know, striding through and trying to make a deal, and uh, these children that were labeled, uh, Schweik's Tykes, these were, uh, remember, this was, uh, Reagan's move to uh, announce Michael, that you know Senator Richard Schweiker of Pennsylvania right. would be his VP nominee. Right. The hope was that they would get additional votes from Pennsylvania or Northeastern delegations that were kind of like-minded. That didn't work out. Segment two, what is inequality doing to the democratic system? Political scientist Francis Fukuyama, quote, longish quotation, but important in my judgment. The benefits of the most recent waves of technological innovation have accrued disproportionately to the most talented and well-educated members of society. The current concentration of wealth has already become self-reinforcing. Schools for the well-off are better than ever. Those for everyone else continue to, to deteriorate. Elites in all societies use their superior access to the political system to protect their interests and American elites are no exception." Close quote. The title of the essay from which I just derived that quotation is, Can Liberal Democracy Survive the Decline of the Middle Class? Uh, elites have always protected uh, their positions in society uh, in human history. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think the difference that Frank Fukuyama is pointing out, um, one way to summarize it is to, be, uh, is to say that particularly in an era we've got all these devices for transmitting words. Uh, there's an advantage for, to people who use words good. Um, is, is that uh, there is a conflict between the two goals that, that most of us in American society, liberals, conservatives, moderates, have, uh, which is meritocracy on the one hand and social mobility on the other. Uh, meritocracy means that you uh, you can rise according to your merits. And in a society like ours, remember, there's not just one ladder of success in society. Uh, and I say that as a graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School. There are other avenues of success in American society uh, in terms of, you know, making a decent living, using your talents to benefit yourself, your family, your community, uh, people that voluntary organizations that so you're involved So you agree with. with Rick Santorum that the suggestion that everybody has to go to college is snobbery? Uh, I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, no, and, and I think actually in that case, Santorum misinterpreted what Barack Obama said and put words into Obama's mouth that Obama had simply not spoken. Uh, so he was on weak ground. Obama did not say everybody should go to college. He said they should have an opportunity to go mm -hmm. to college, which is you know, uh, to me, Different. kind of unexceptionable thing. But there's, uh, what happens if you have, the more you have a meritocracy, a fair society, um, the more that uh, you will tend to have less social mobility because if people in the, you know, top 5% of the cognitive elite, people who use words good, 
people who are good with numbers. Um, you know, go to the same schools, uh, go to the same career paths. They will tend to marry each other, a right. assortative mating. You will tend to uh, meet and marry, and you will tend to produce children who will tend to have talents and abilities similar to yours. And so uh, the ultimate result is that uh, children will start off in the place where they ought to end up in. Michael, with regard, inequality with regard specifically to the electoral process, Here's the way things stand now with, with regard to campaign finance. As a result of the McCain-Feingold campaign finance legislation of 2002, couple that with the Supreme Court's 2010 decision in Citizens United, contributions to candidates and political parties are capped and heavily regulated, but to so-called super PACs, which have to operate independently of parties and candidates, super PACs are allowed to raise unlimited funds from individuals, corporations. Does this make sense to you? Uh, I think, Excuse me, I, what, Sheldon Adelson, one of the wealthiest men in, in America, whose uh, fortune is uh, casinos in uh, Las Vegas and also in Macau. Macau is where he gets most of his money That's these where days. the real fortune is. So he's worth, about, last time I checked Google on, he's worth $21 billion, and he's given Newt Gingrich, committed $20 million. To, this is one man effectively financing a presidential campaign, and he said he might give Gingrich $100 million. Is this sensible? Um, super PAC, not Gingrich. Gingrich's super PAC. Well, I think the apparatus of regulation that we've built up over the years with various legislation, court uh, rulings limited it, um, you know, ends up with a result that has all sorts of perversities in it. Uh, and that's almost bound to happen when you've had a process like this. Um, if I, I think the better, you... the better lodestar is the First Amendment, isn't it? Um, and which basically says that uh, you know we 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 have a First Amendment so in large part so we can have free political speech. That's one of the things the founders want. Now the Supreme Court has said that the First Amendment protects student armbands, nude dancing, and flag burning. Uh, all arguable decisions, I think, agree or disagree. Uh, but they have um, been hesitant to say that it affects all political speech. It seems to me they've got, you know, our republic can continue with or without uh, nude dancing, student armbands, and flag burning. Uh, but without political speech, I think we are in some peril. If I could give you your druthers, you would simply wipe away McCain-Feingold and subsequent regulation and let any American give any amount of money to any candidate or party he chooses. Is that the Barone position? I think I... I think that would be preferable to what we have now. I, I didn't always believe that, and I've come to think that. I think I, with the addition that I think we should have some disclosure. Now, you could make an argument that mandatory disclosure violates the First Amendment. I note that, uh, you know, these super PACs that uh, people talk about as being uh, hazy, we don't know who's involved about them. But they have to, they quite love to go well. on TV. You've got uh, uh, Shelton Adelson of the Newt Gingrich, as you said, is talking, well, I could give $100 million. He's having the time of his life, he's as best I can tell. He's making all this money in Macau and some more in Las Vegas, and he can spend it uh, on this and that. Foster Fries, uh, who is the uh, the chief donor or the initial donor of the super PAC backing Rick Santorum, has gone on the air and made a joke which Santorum had to uh, had to renounce, and, and Foster Free said, well, my wife told me I shouldn't say that, and it wasn't a good idea. His wife was right. Uh, but the fact is, these, and we've got President Obama saying that, well, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to unilaterally disarm, uh, facing the prospect that as much money could be spent on behalf of the Republican candidate as was, is being spent on the Democratic candidate. After the Democrats have had a money advantage, not only in 2008 when the Republican Party was in trouble with the voters, but in 2004 when you had an incumbent Republican president running for re-election. Democrats don't think it's fair unless they have a money advantage. <laughs> uh, and so President Obama, equality is not what they want in fundraising. Or it's only fair if they have more money. So President Obama says, we'll have a super PAC too, and I won't talk to the super PAC, but my cabinet members can attend super PAC fundraisers, but hey, we're not going to coordinate. Well, of course, they don't coordinate. 
what they do is Foster Fries and Sheldon Adelson and other people tell Politico or the Washington Post or Instapundit or somebody uh, what they're going to do, and that gets uh, printed. It, it appears in print around. and pixels. The communication takes place. There's nothing too shady about this. People can spot the ads on TV and put them on YouTube once they're the first time they're up. Uh, and we have a fairly good idea of what's going on, and despite the lack of disclosure requirements, we're learning But you're not, arguing, you're not arguing, that, you're not saying that argues in favor of retaining the current system. Well, I'm saying so that the current... As long as we know what people should be giving money to the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and the candidates. Let the candidates take responsibility for running their own campaigns. It's one of our complicated systems, and that we have just like the, uh, okay. you know, we're contemplating the current Republican electoral calendar, and uh, Nate Silver, the... Uh, he was a sports Times. statistics guy who became really a terrific political statistics guy in the New York Times was classifying the different Republican selection methods for are the delegates bound, are they not bound, are they chosen at this level. He said, well, I'm going to divide it, I think, in, I, think I remember, in eight categories, but you could have a larger number of categories <laughs> okay. uh, to do it. So it's a Baroque system, but you know what? It, the presidential nominating system is the weakest part of our political system, interestingly. It's one part that's not touched on in the Constitution at all. Segment three, divides. Two quotations on social and economic conservatism in the GOP. Kim Strassel in the Wall Street Journal. Quote, Rick Santorum has a potentially fatal general election liability on social issues. His supporters may admire him for taking on this subject, and they may be swallowing his argument that this is nothing more than a media conjured controversy. This is the contraception yeah. business. But that's baloney, close quote. Also in the Wall Street Journal, James Toronto's interview a couple of weeks ago with Jeff Bell, yeah. who's the author of a new book, The Case for Polarized Politics. Quote, Mr. Bell sees social issues as the path to the GOP majority in 2012. The social issues he notes account for the George W. Bush era red-blue divide, which Mr. Bell says endures and red Republicans have the advantage. Quoting Jeff Bell, by 2004, every state, all 31 states that Bush carried, were socially conservative. Those states now have 292 electoral votes, and 270 gets you elected president. Michael? Um, well, of course, I'm not comfortable targeting just 292 electoral votes, but uh, uh, I think both points have some validity. Uh, when I w worked in the polling business for Peter Hart, with Peter Hart, mm -hmm. Peter Hart, the Democratic pollster in the 1974-81 period, uh, one of Peter's statements was, he who frames the issues uh, tends to determine the outcome of the election. Uh, and when you're talking about the social issues, I like to use the term cultural issues. Um, the, uh, you framing like the social the, issues so framing much you the issue, them. Frame, well, framing, well, because you could say economic issues are social issues too. What's social? It's society. Um, but the, uh, the cultural issues, it matters very much how you frame issues. Uh, if you raise an issue, as Rick Santorum did in uh, an October interview with a website called Caffeinated Thoughts, uh, perhaps even a little too caffeinated, and when you raise the issue as whether, whether or not contraception is okay, and Rick Santorum says contraception is not okay, uh, then you risk uh, being, uh, taking a position that is very much a minority position in American life. Uh, it Im phrasing it that way implies that you want to ban contraception. Now, Sam Torah makes the point that no, he's never advocated that, and he might make the additional point that uh, the Supreme Court has prevented that since Griswold v. Connecticut, which 47 years ago, right. and the contraception bans that they overturned in Connecticut and Massachusetts, in fact, were not effectively enforced as people who went to universities during that period could give you vivid testimony uh, in those states. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, the fact is that that's not the way you want to frame the issue. You want to frame the issue with that particular issue uh, the way that some Republicans and a few, some Democrats have framed uh, their response to President Obama uh, and the Secretary of HHS decision to require insurance coverage uh, for contraception. Uh, abortifacient, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, de uh, devices or medicines and, uh, and on people who have a religious-based uh, conscientious objection. 
to using those sort of things? Are you going to use government to force people to violate their conscience? That's a much stronger position, uh, a much stronger way to frame the issue because as so a number of people, Sant well, we've, you know, we made exception to the military draft in World War II for people that had conscientious objection right. to going right. to war. Um, you know, that, those were life and death decisions. The American people accept the idea of not trying to force something, you know, right. to force people to violate their consciences is something we don't like. Uh, to suggest that you think contraception is really a bad, bad thing, an immoral thing, boy, that's not the best way to frame the issue. Okay, so here's somebody who has framed the issue in the terms you've suggested, and as best I can tell, in textbook terms, has framed one issue after another correctly, if you'll see what I mean in a moment. And that's Mitt Romney. Larry Sabato, political scientist Larry Sabato. A force that has defined the GOP contest cannot be denied. A sizable section of the party base, arguably a majority, does not connect or trust, connect with or trust Mitt Romney. Romney's can of dog food has the handsomest label, the best placement in the store by the grocers, the most astute TV advertising, but the dogs turn up their noses at the contents. Michael, why doesn't Mitt Romney have this thing? Why hasn't he had it locked up for three or four weeks? Well, I think the dynamic of this contest is um, one that reminds me of the Democratic Party some 40 years ago, where the Tea Party movement, if we can use that term to encompass people who were not necessarily Tea Partiers, but the, the movement of people in Russia into political activity of hundreds of thousands of people in opposition to the vast expansion of the size and scope of government by the Obama Democrats. They've got a strong point of view that's based on a very contemporary set of issues, those that have been arisen since January 2009. Um, and they want a candidate who is pure on these issues, just as the peace people that Gene arose McCarthy. in 1967, 68, uh, mostly within the Democratic Party, but in opposition to policies of Democratic presidents. Um, they wanted a pure candidate as well. Uh, and from the point of view of both groups, it made a certain amount of sense to have a pure candidate. The problem is that a candidate with any experience is not going to be pure. And um, the purest candidate in this Republican cycle was Michelle Bachman. Gone. Uh, she failed to carry Black Hawk County, Iowa, the place where she was born, grew up, and uh, announced her candidacy. Uh, she was out of the race. She was, you know, she spent five years as a backbench member of the House of Representatives. Did not have, I guess, in the judgment of voters, the experience okay, and so stature to do it. Rick, Rick each, of these each of these candidates has flaws. Uh, the remaining candidates has flaws from the point of view of the purest believer, the, the current right. co contemporary core of the Republican Party. Mitt Romney is not the only one that has flaws. And so, so, so let me just ask you this. Santorum, who lost his last Senate race in Pennsylvania by 18 points, has very little money, and as Mitt Romney's negative advertising has been demonstrating in Michigan, cast a number of votes during his two terms in the Senate that would more than raise eyebrows among Tea Party members looking for a purist. You've got Santorum, much less money, giving Mitt Romney a real run for it in Michigan today. As we, why is that? I mean, I, that that's not a purist. Well, none of these. You know, I, Peter, you treat Mitt Romney as if he was a person with obvious entered this race with obviously overwhelming credentials for the presidency. Oh, and you don't you, think so? Well, look. At, let's look at a little history here. I mean, go back to you know, uh, period. People who had overwhelming credentials were people like um, Thomas Dewey, the governor, three-term governor of New York, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, four-term governor of New York and former assistant secretary of state for Latin American affairs in World War II, um, Richard Nixon, senator from California, an important congressman, vice president of the United States for eight years, uh, and Reagan ultimately and Ronald two years, Reagan, two, two terms. terms as governor of California. Um, those are candidates that you say, well, on the basis of, uh, you know, long records in very major and highly visible positions, uh, and in the case of many, an acquaintance with world leaders and foreign policy, these are people who 
obviously recommend themselves as serious political candidates, and, and candidates, by the way, from states that were then marginal in political presidential politics. Um, Mitt Romney is a one-term governor in Massachusetts. Rick Santorum, as you pointed out, served two terms in the Senate, two terms in the House, was defeated 59 to 41 on his last try with the voters of a target state. Uh, and okay. you can go down the list. So let me ask you another question then. It ties in with this. You and I had a conversation on a Ricochet podcast once. This would be maybe two months ago. This was when Michelle Bachman and others, when the whole lineup was still in the race. And I said, Michael, what do you make of this lineup? A longer than usual pause from you. <laughs> and you replied, well, in my mind, if I click down through my list of the people I consider the 10 most talented and impressive Republicans, not one of them is a candidate. Why did this happen? Is this something wrong with the system, or was it just bad luck? Mitch Daniels decided not to, Haley did. What, what happened here? Uh, Paul Ryan had no interest. Jeb Bush is, didn't want to run for a variety of reasons, some of which are obvious. So is it the system, or was it just a series of bad, call, it's, bad it's, hops, so to I, speak? I think the answer is both. Uh, the presidential nominating system is the weakest part of our political system, and one of the things it tends to require of people is a huge commitment in terms of time and psychic energy that not everybody wants to make. Uh, Sane people don't want to do it. Yeah, and well, the fact is, think about this, Peter. Is being president actually a desirable job? Let's say you had an opportunity to be president tomorrow. Would you prefer that to your current life? Uh, I mean, you, you believe you have the intellectual equipment uh, and some experience to appreciate some aspects of being president, but I don't think you'd really want to do it. Being responsible for the lives and deaths of people, I think, really weighs heavily on these people. I think it has weighed heavily on Barack Obama and explains at least some of his decisions not to immediately cut and run in Iraq mm -hmm. uh, and things. Ultimately, with the election pending, he made the opposite decision, but I think that uh, we don't know what it's like. Listen to the tape of Franklin Roosevelt's D-Day radio broadcast. Have you listened to that at some point? Is that on YouTube? Must be. It's on YouTube. It's, uh, it's a radio address. It's a prayer in total. Of course, think of what George W. Bush would have inspired if he had made a broadcast that was all a prayer. Oh, that's uh, right. We ask the, the <laughs> blessings of Almighty God. On, yeah. Yes, I, I do. And yeah. so forth. Listen to his voice. This is not the voice of a man who is cynical or blasé about what he has ordered to happen that day. This is, this is a voice of a man who was, uh, you know, look at the pictures of Roosevelt had right. terrible health for a right. variety of reasons and not the kind of uh, treatment that we would certainly want today. Uh, but, but he was himself a casualty of the Second World War. Well, yes. It killed him. Segment four, the 44th chief executive. Michael Barone commenting on a portrait of Barack Obama that appeared not long ago in The New Yorker. Quote, Obama prefers getting information and making decisions by staying up late and reading memos rather than meeting with people, a temperament that's a liability, close quote. Well, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. famously said of Franklin Roosevelt, second-rate intellect but first-rate temperament. Is it the other way around with Barack Obama? Um. Well, I'm not sure that it's a first-rate intellect. He's obviously, well, he's obviously, you know, easily meets the minimal standards Remind of intelligence. Remind me never to cross you, Michael. No, he easily <laughs> meets the minimal standards that, for intelligence that we've set in a president, as, you know, the last ex-presidents have done. And he as most, the I th And I think all the presidential, major party presidential nominees have done uh, in my uh, experience. But, uh, you know, he's... I think it's a liability for a president to like to be alone or alone with his wife, as Ronald Reagan did at night, because one of the biggest sources of political capital as a president is spending time with other people so they can tell their friends and associates and enemies that they've been talking to the president and they think this and that. You enlist people on your team if you spend time with them. And one of the things that came through in Ryan Liz's piece in The New Yorker, to which I was making reference, and uh, in my Washington Examiner column, I think, and, and in other writing is that uh, President Obama doesn't like to call members of Congress. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to get on the phone with them. He talks almost never with uh, the Republican leaders of the Congress, even when you have a Republican Speaker of the House. Uh, the impression one gets, certainly, is that there's far less communication between Speaker John Boehner and President Barack Obama than there was between Speaker Newt Gingrich and, and President Bill Clinton. 
uh, who seem to speak and interact frequently. Um, yeah. and, and so, uh, you know, I think that that's, that's simply a problem. I mean, President Reagan might have been better served if, in some ways, if he had spent more time doing this. I think to some extent he got a pass from people because he was in his 70s, because he had been shot by a would-be murderer. And, and during working hours, he was gregarious. During working he hours, wanted, he was he quite just... capable of being gregarious, but he, you know, he wasn't going to spend that amount of time. People, you know, and presidents who do could still get in trouble. Lyndon right. Johnson liked to talk to members of Congress Bill and all Clinton. sorts of people. Uh, Bill Clinton, uh, very gregarious, on the phone till late at night with people. Um, okay. Barack Obama, first-rate intellect or merely pretty good intellect, What's in that mind? Stanley Kurtz in his book Radical in Chief, quote, from his socialist days at Occidental College to his life-transforming encounters at New York Socialist Scholars Conferences to his immersion in the stealthily socialist community, you can see where this is going, community organizer networks of Chicago, Barack Obama has lived in a thoroughly socialist world, close quote. So is he at some level a socialist? Is the huge increase in government spending from roughly 20 percent of GDP to 24 percent of GDP during this man's first term intentional, part of an ideological impulse? Yeah. Uh, really? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think it is. I think that, uh, you know, some of the sophisticated... I thought you would poo-poo that. You're you know, not some of the to. sophisticated Democrats would say... Um, well, you know, government spending is likely to go up as a percentage of GDP because we've got an older population, which is more dependent on Social Security and Medicare and so forth. Uh, and that's a direction we're kind of ineluctably going um, unless we change policies on those issues. Uh, I think the case for changing policies on those issues is very strong. Uh, but look at the choices President Obama has made. He has chosen to live in university communities. Uh, all his life. All his life. Uh, all the times when he's had a choice. I mean, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, I suppose, is a choice in a different way. But uh, he's chosen to live in university communities. He chose to make his way politically in Chicago in a heavily Democratic constituency. He sought to win a black majority congressional district. Uh, he had, uh, he did win without, in part by eliminating the opposition, a state Senate district uh, that was a big black majority. Uh, but also included the university community. And when he had an opportunity to redraw the boundaries in the redistricting following the 2000 census, it was interesting. He gives it a black majority. It goes into the south side, you know, 98% black community, but also includes the Hyde Park Kenwood University District where he lived. And then it goes up the lakeshore and includes North Michigan Avenue and those apartments along uh, Lake Michigan where a lot of the very rich, liberal, democratic contributors lived. He made sure they were in his district, too. Um, and that's his political world. Chicago, the right wing is Richie, Richie Daly. Uh, the, uh, you know, you've got some Polish neighborhoods Richie still Daly, at the former edge, mayor. the right. former, ed, you know, at the edge of the city. Uh, Republicans, they're not Stick. part of the conversation. They're right. not a significant factor, right. and there's no need to engage their ideas because they just really don't count for anything. And the attitude of Chicago Democrats to the private sector has always been that, look, uh, there's, there's lots of big businesses in Chicago and they will always have to, you can put any amount of burden on them and they will always pay up and they won't leave and we can milk them for as much as we want. That's what a private sector is for. You mentioned Nate Silver, the statistician who writes for the New York Times. Recent article by Silver in the New York Times Magazine entitled, Here Comes Class Warfare. Quote, by trading votes among wealthy whites for more among working class ones, Obama would bolster his margins in Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Michigan. He could gain a few points in Indiana, and his chances of winning North Carolina would go up as well. Close quote. Between now and Election Day, Barack Obama will campaign as a ruthless class warrior. Yes? Uh, I think that's the, the process he's set out on. I mean, he told us in the 2008 campaign when Charlie Gibson of ABC asked him, uh, would you increase capital gains taxes even if that meant less revenue to the government? He said yes. Well, what is, you know, what is that as public? Well, what it is is public policy is saying, I want to remove the power of the private sector. 
want to take money away from them so that they will have less chance to finance voluntary associations, less chance to uh, independently exert their influence on public policy and the debate and so forth. I want to give government more of a monopoly of power in society and have less in the way of countervailing powers uh, existing here. That's why I want to take rich people's money away from them. Uh, and I think that's uh, his public policy and I think he believes in a larger state that the Europeans have the right idea. Uh, one of his um, chief aides, I think it was Valerie Jarrett, said, well, gee, in any other country he'd get 70 percent of the vote, which is another way of saying this country where he only gets 53 is not a very good country, but it's the, you know, it is the biggest country, so we'll take it. Um, but we'd really like to have, you know, sort of a supersized Sweden instead or something of that Michael, nature. Michael, you know what you're doing here. What you're doing is saying to those of you out in the middle of the country who are members of the Tea Party, who listen to Sean Hannity and tune in Rush every morning, you, Michael Barone, Harvard undergraduate, Yale College, author for four law decades, school. law school, author for some four decades of the biennial almanac of American politics, and intellectuals intellectual are saying to middle America, everything you fear about Barack Obama is true. Well, not everything that people fear. I don't believe that he was born abroad. I don't believe that he's... Uh, <laughs> oh, right. I know he's not a Muslim. I, Every know, sane thing that people he fear. He was born in Hawaii. Uh, he is a Christian. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, he I, wants to turn this country into a bigger Belgium. Well, he talked about fundamental transformation in the 2008 and he debate. Means it. And he means it. And you have, uh, you know, I think that's, he thinks that would be better. Segment five, this election. To return to the passage with which we began, Michael Barone in the 2012 edition of the Almanac of American Politics, quote, Americans voted in record numbers for Democrats in 2008 and in record numbers for Republicans in 2010. Not so long ago, it seemed inconceivable that there could be such extreme oscillation in American voting behavior, close quote. What brought the inconceivable to pass? Um, I think perceived public policy failure of uh, or uh, opposition to public policies uh, that voters, uh, you know, when things didn't turn out the way voters hoped they would. Um, period 1995 to 2005, you have almost static political alignments. Mm -hmm. Trench warfare politics, I called it in my introductions to the Almanac of American Politics during that period. And, the numbers vary little, very, very, very little from one election to the other. You know, we, there are all sorts of metrics where you can prove this. I mean, the three states change parties between the 2000 and 2004 uh, presidential election. You know, the period House uh, popular vote percentages for the two parties in House elections are almost within a two-point band in that whole period. Uh, then suddenly, 05, 06. Uh, Katrina, Baghdad, uh, the pictures of helplessness following this, a sense that uh, we had gotten into wars which initially the American people supported uh, that were not going well, that things were out of control. Uh, you had George Bush's job rating goes down to the levels of Harry Truman during right. the uh, Korean War where we were in a war that we couldn't get out of and couldn't win and we were taking casualties. I mean in Korea uh, the number of casualties was about uh, 50,000 total magnitude of well, 40,000 or something like that. In other words, 10 times right. Iraq, right, a right, country right, right. that was half right. the population. Um, but, you know, that was, we had very negative things there. And then, of course, you have the uh, financial collapse of September 08. Uh, so that contributes to Democrats winning 53 uh, uh, percent for Barack Obama. That's more than any other Democratic so nominee you don't in see history except Andrew Jackson, Franklin Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson. The electorate is not coming untethered. You don't see an electorate suddenly just sort of sliding from one end like, like Marvel. Well, the metric of the House. They're, re they're responding to reality. They're to responding really to reality and then we get the Obama Democrats go on this process of vastly expanding the size and scope of government. Uh, the stim, you know, the seven hundred eighty-seven billion dollar stimulus. That's uh, one third of which is simply a payoff to the public employee union uh, people who supported right. Obama and provided the bulk of the four hundred million dollars the Democrats got from the labor unions the 08 cycle. Uh, and then the health care plan, where the American people are screaming through the medium of the unlikely medium of the voters of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, don't pass this bill. Stop. And they stop pass now. it. 
uh, and it continues to be unpopular. One of the things we learned in 2009 and 2010 is that the New Deal historian's lesson that uh, economic distress makes Americans more supportive of or amenable to big government uh, policies is not right. Or, 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 or no longer correct. Well, I argued in my book, Our Country, it's published in 1990, that it was wrong. From the uh, get-go. That it was, a, it was an incomplete, at least, uh, uh, incompletely supported by the events of the 1930s. It was written up by hagiographic, really partisan writers and, and beautifully gifted and talented writers uh, of the Roosevelt New Deal, who basically followed Roosevelt's lead in describing right. the country he was in and what he was doing. Incomplete picture. Newt Gingrich, 2012, re represents, quote, the most important election of our lifetime, close quote. Rick Santorum, quote, I believe this is the most important election in your lifetime no matter how old you are, close quote. Google on the terms 2012, lifetime, the most important election, and you will get more than half a million results. Characterize the election of 2012 in your view. Well, I, you know, I've heard candidates say that in earlier cycles, and my first reaction is a little cynically to say, um, "Well, it's the most important election in their lifetime for them." Uh, you know, if, to get elected president or not get elected president is a pretty important event in your lifetime. Um, the, uh, I do think this is, you know, an important election because of the numbers that you cited earlier in this interview when you pointed out that we moved the federal government from 20% of GDP to 24%. As big as, bigger than 1980? Four, yeah, well, four points sounds like, you know, oh, only four points. That's a huge transfer of power to the government, and if that's going to continue and accelerate if Obama uh, is reelected, and there is the potential uh, for a, a reversal and a change if a Republican president is elected. I don't say an assurance, but a pro potential. Uh, and that's a big public policy difference. Um, you know, political tacticians have been uh, focused so for many years. It is true. It is accurate and true and fair to say that the choice facing the American electorate in 2012 is between an America consonant with our own history and tradition of American exceptionalism, Tocqueville's America, on the one hand, and on the other hand, an America moving rapidly in the direction of a European model. Fair? Um, yes, I think that's fair. It's obviously a, a, a way of framing the issue that uh, would tend to be advantageous to Republicans and disadvantageous to Democrats. And if Let's you hope. talk to, you know, a smart Democrat like Bill Galston, Brookings Institution, I think he would have some problem with that or want to qualify that in some significant way. Um, but I think I would argue that that's a pretty fair description. We've got we've got a decision between Tocqueville's America and Tocqueville's France. Two quotations, Charles Murray and Coming Apart. Both of these are Charles. Quotation one, any program to return the nation to its founding principles of limited government must, quote, quote, gain the support of the new upper class if it is to be ratified. Too much power is now held by the new upper class to expect otherwise. These folks who have prospered during the last 30 years of economic expansion. Quotation two, the new upper class tends to be liberal, right? There is no way of getting around it. Every way of answering that question produces a yes. Uh, is the upper class liberal? Um, and do we do, do, must what, the country? One of the things support? you one of the things you see in the country, and you see it um, in patterns of migration. Where do quote elite unquote people choose to live? Because they often they, they really do have you know. High achieving professionals do have a choice of where to live. And, you know, the liberals moved to New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles. The conservatives moved to Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and Atlanta. Um, they seek culturally uh, congenial environments. And, uh, you know, politics of elite people tends to follow culture more than economics. I've argued in my book, Our Country, that generally speaking, American political conflict tends to divide us more along cultural and economic lines, though there are examples of both. Uh, but certainly for elite Americans today, what, what one sees in the, let's say, 20 years between uh, 1992 and, and, well, and, and today is that for most of that period, we saw affluent voters generally and the particularly visible liberal elite, uh, the affluent elites in places like New York and L.A. and San Francisco move left on cultural issues, things like abortion 
to some extent, same-sex marriage were important issues to them. I see some changes among those people uh, in interesting ways. Number one, they've turned on the teachers' unions. Stephen Brill's article in The New Yorker, The Rubber Room, uh, the, date, the, the Al Gore filmmaker making a movie about the evils of the public schools, that they, they're not happy lining up with the teacher unions anymore. Um, That's big. Racial quotas and preferences. The columnist from a hair, a liberal based in Rhode Island, uh, writes kind of interesting stuff. Has a column this morning, or this week, uh, coming out against racial quotas and preferences. She says, well, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor said they should last another 25 years. Uh, that was nine years ago. She says, it's time to accelerate, get rid of them now. Um, that's moving away from a cultural liberal orthodoxy. Uh, and I think that. Uh, what they see is that uh, some of these, some of the allies that they've been happy to go along with in the Democratic Party are serving the country badly and in ways that they really don't like when they're forced to look at it. And the idea that uh, we're going to have a more prosperous country by, you know, jacking up the tax rates, I'm not sure that that's too attractive to them. Economics has replaced cultural issues as the chief focus of attention in this election cycle as it did in 2010. Uh, we saw some movement among affluent voters there. And I would note that Mitt Romney, both in 2008 when he was labeled the more conservative of several candidates, mm -hmm. and in the 2012 cycle when he's been labeled by many as the moderate or establishment candidate, even though his issue positions haven't changed a whole lot. Um, always carries the highest income areas, runs best in the high income areas. Now, it's not attractive for a Republican to brag about carrying rich people, uh, but their vote, each vote counts one. Uh, and, you know, if you compare, say, 1988 when the first George Bush won 53 percent with more recent Republican showings, which have never come up to that level, the biggest loss is in the affluent suburbs of the largest, in some central city neighborhoods of the largest non-Southern metro areas. Uh, I think there's the potential for a Mitt Romney candidacy to regain some of that, both because these people are less um, supportive of the, of, of the uh, uh, liberal, some of the liberal allies. Uh, cultural issues are less important. They feel less threatened by a, quote, anti-abortion candidate. And um, it's time to move on. And uh, anecdotal evidence that he does well with with affluent women. He has been carrying women in all these primaries. Affluent women is his best demographic. Michael, last question. Last question. Think now, you're a, you are really in your bones a historian, but now I'm thinking, asking you to think beyond Tocqueville, think in terms of millennia. <laughs> the financial system in this country is still recovering, if it is recovering, from the crisis of 2008. We're suffering slow growth, high unemployment. We borrow 40 cents of every dollar the federal government spends. The Secretary of Defense not long ago announced that we may be unable to afford an aircraft, new aircraft carrier anytime soon. On and on and on. Empires rise and fall. Countries reach their moment of vigor and decline. What's happening to us is what happened to Britain after the Second World War. The American moment has simply passed. Do you feel it? Do you buy it? No, I don't. Let me give you one number to suggest that one reason I don't buy it. 2.1. Replacement, replacement fertility. The United States is continuing to grow uh, demographically. Uh, there are some problematic things about the way we're growing. We talked earlier about you know the white working class, the decline of marriage and two-parent families, voluntary association connections that people have. We've got a black underclass that's still a problem, though considerably less of one than was the case 20 years ago. We've made progress there, actually. Uh, crime control, welfare reform. Um, we've got, you know, uh, we've got, you know, a downscale Latino migrants who have not assimilated as much as I would like uh, to have done and have not been as upwardly mobile. So we got problems there, but we're growing. Um, and, you know, we've got when you compare the rest of the world, much of Europe, demographic decline. Russia, de disastrous demographic decline. China, uh, in grave danger of growing old before they grow rich. Demographic, their working population has peaked. Japan, living in very comfortable old age. 
uh, the oldest society on earth. In the 1930s it had the highest birth rates in the world. Now it's got one of the lowest and um, everything is comfortable there. They've got, for old people, the taxis, they don't have to open the door on the taxis. The driver pushes a button and the door opens and closes. Uh, so, you know, old people don't have to, uh, you know, machines do things. They're basically, without immigration, they're replacing people with machines. Uh, America has more potential in that. And, uh, you know, I fear some of the policies of this administration are squeezing out the creativity of people. And I would point to one thing, high, higher tax rates. At some point, when you get above 40% uh, individual income tax marginal rate on the top rate, the animal spirits of economically creative people in this society are diverted from productive investment, invention, innovation, and creativity into tax avoidance. Right. I remember in the 1970s when the top rate was 70%, rich men would get together and they basically, a conversation would go along the lines, my tax shelter is bigger than your tax shelter. Uh, and we had a sluggish economy in, large, in part because it was a result of that. One of the things lower tax rates in the 80s give us is this and that. Uh, the Obama Democrats with their Chicago-like view that uh, affluent people can be milked of any amount of money and there will still be plenty there. You can, you can plunder the rich uh, to an infinite extent. I think are at risk of doing what the, I thought the Clinton administration tax increases would do, it, but what in but fact they did not do. Right. They stayed under 40. 39.6 was very clever. Uh, stay under 40 and that psychological barrier isn't back. The Obama Democrats with their already built-in Medicare increase in the Obamacare bill and in their proposal to go to a nominal 39.6 with other deductions things, they're going to put us above 40. I think you're getting into a danger zone. We just saw in Britain with the 50 percent rate, top rate, uh, they thought they were going to bring in a billion pounds more and they brought in 500 million pounds less or some such numbers. Uh, but when it, when it comes right down to it, having a baby is a vote in favor of the future, and that's still taking place. That's still taking place in America uh, in a way that it's not taking place in most of the developed world. And even, you know, countries like Mexico and Brazil are on the brink of no replacement birth rates. So we get that in part because of immigrants, uh, but... Uh, and we have some problems, but, but on balance, uh, we've got a better prospect than most of our would-be competitors. Michael Barone, principal author for Lo These Four Decades Now of the Almanac of American Politics, now in its 2012 edition. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.